Here we go. Good morning, Brian. I don't know about you, but that countdown always seems to just fire me right up. <laughs> and I am ready Absolutely. to get into it today. How are you? What's going on on your end? Good, Trav. Doing well. We had an eventful weekend in terms of the real news uh, with uh, Joe Biden, the Democratic candidate here in the U.S., deciding with, to withdraw his name from candidacy uh, for the 2024 election. The widespread expectation is Kamala Harris. So, um, obviously, us not being a political channel, we don't need to get into the nitty gritty of that. But obviously, we can talk about the fact that the crypto uh, community finds it to be a big deal, as they probably should. So um, I'm excited to get into that a little bit. And of course, go over your chain link prediction that we did on a call last week to see how that's gone so far, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. So excited. Excited. Hey, well, shared sentiment there, uh, pun fully intended here. So, uh, yeah, lots to cover today. We've had some pretty dramatic news happen, which, as we have all seen, the crypto market has an immediate, had an immediate reaction to, and I'm very excited to get into that. And then we also have some developments with our, um, our positions from last week. And just to kind of catch everyone up, what we did last week is we utilize the Sandbase on-chain metrics uh, to try and start to come up with a um a very functional um a, a very a very helpful uh trading strategy and so we've actually started one about a week ago today if i if i'm not mistaken there brian and um i mean there's the position itself which i'm excited to share with everyone but then also some new um data that's recently been uh, discovered on that specific token as well which i'm also very excited to share with everyone here so Without further ado, I'm ready to get into it if you are. What do you think? Let's make it happen. Yeah, why don't you pop up your screen? We can look at your Sanar account and kind of show what uh, what you did from last week. Perfect. Let's do that right now here, pulling it up as we speak. Excellent. So here is my dashboard, and I'm going to scroll down, and I warn everyone, it's, it's kind of lackluster, but we'll pull them up. Also, Brian, I do want to clarify that um, after reviewing my position last time, I realized that I kind of messed up the profit to loss ratio. So I did enter a second position. Um, I believe with Sanar, there's a restriction. You can only uh, create a position once every four hours per asset, um, which, of course, is to keep people from spamming and taking advantage of the incredible program that you guys have right now on Sanar. Uh, but I did just want to share that with you just because before it was only a one to one profit loss ratio. Now it's a two to one. Um, also, though, the entry was a little bit better as well. But uh, regardless, nice. let's what, jump. When you in. say profit loss ratio, what are you referring to for everyone watching? I am so glad that you asked that, my friend. <laughs> so essentially, uh, for me, profit loss ratio is um, so I set my uh, stop loss and take profit. And in order for. Uh, in order to kind of satisfy my risk management, I like to have at least a two to one profit to loss ratio. So that means I've set, for example, my stop loss. Actually, you know, let me let me step back one more one more step here. So we entered at about fourteen and a half dollars. My stop loss is twelve dollars. To have a two to one profit loss ratio, I need to have my take profit at twice the amount for my entry price as is my stop loss. So if my entry is at 450, if my stop loss is at uh, $12, that's a $2.50 difference between my entry and my stop loss. That would make that would mean for uh, to have a successful 2 to 1 profit to loss ratio, I would need my stop loss to be at I believe $19. I could be messing that up. But I think that sounds right. Yeah, it's it's perfect. definitely more on the advanced trading side of things to have 
uh, a ratio in mind when when you enter a trade and have a stop loss, things like that. I'm glad you did it because it's a more realistic way of trading as though real money was involved, even though in this case, we're just doing it for a contest where yes, you can win real money, but you're still veering on the safe side of things while opening a stop loss, which many people advocate for, a few people don't for the record, to each their own. That's why we have all of these options. But that clarifies things pretty well. And um, from what we can see, the performance is at negative 23%. Part of that's due to the fact that we did leverage 10X, right? We wanted to really go for the gusto. And so far with Link about down about 2.3%, uh, you multiply that by 10 and that's how we get minus 23 uh, and why it looks worse than it is. but. If we get any sort of pop, uh, which there are still arguments where that could happen in the next couple of days, then all of a sudden that minus 23 can quickly turn into a plus 30, you know, knock on wood. So we'll see how that goes. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So definitely still very, very hopeful with this position here. Um, if we look at my other position that I opened afterwards, uh, even with the 10x um, uh, leverage uh, component to that one here, we're only down about 7%. So that one looks quite a bit better. And then also, if we were to consider that during our last conversation, we spoke about how in a realistic world, we likely would have waited until price dropped around to this level anyways, before entering. Mm -hmm. um, the reason we didn't do that is, of course, for entertainment purposes, we wanted to just jump right in while we were live. But you can see that if we would have waited to that, we would have definitely still been in profit right now, and uh, a decent amount as well. So yeah, why don't we why don't we quickly discuss here what actually went into this trading decision and what, if anything, we would have done differently. And let's of course drop that uh, that new data that we found. Anyways, what do you think there, Brian? I love it. Yeah, of course, this is still a long term decision, right? We didn't just trade Link to uh, jump in and jump out in one or two days. We wanted to have it run for the entirety of this contest, which is still uh seven or eight days away i believe before we see the the winners and losers so the goal for trav here is to have him uh get the best average trade either through just this one or through a series of different trades he does and uh if he does he wins a couple hundred bucks worth of sand tokens which is part of our way of saying thank you for participating in our mock trading platform uh, which is essentially free to open trades in other than gas fees. So um, Santamon's basically giving away coins every two weeks for part of these contests. So I just want to give that contest context, excuse me. And without further ado, Trav, why don't we look at some of those uh, those charts you mentioned? Let's do just that. And actually, Brian, I was just inspired by something you said. Uh, if if we do happen to win, uh, I think it would only be fair if we take some of these profits and share it with our community. So if it's all right with you, here's what I propose. Of all of the people who actually quote tweet this live stream, if we do win any sort of uh, any sort of um, uh, prize at the end of this, uh, I propose we share some of that with, um, we'll have to see, at least one, maybe even more. Um, uh, individuals who do go ahead and quote tweet, tweet this space. What do you think? I mean, spoken like a true marketer, how could I ever object to that? It's a great <laughs> idea. I love it. I love it. And I do just want to take a quick moment to thank everyone who is watching our stream today. I'm um, seeing the numbers now. We have over 327 people hanging out with us right now. So I just want to send some appreciation and gratitude for you guys spending your time with us today to check out this incredible technology that uh, I'm certainly very excited to share with all of you today. So Let's get back into it, Brian. Let's do it, man. I am going to pull up the sand base chart here. Actually, before I do, I just want to di um, direct everyone's attention here on the very bottom of the screen that's currently up right now. And just to kind of tease the metrics that we did uh, consider when making this, this uh, specific position here. So there was a negative weighted sentiment. There was a 365 day MVRV that was neutral. And we had some whale accumulation here as well. So just to kind of keep that in mind, we will explain these, of course, um, coming up soon here. I'm just going to take a moment and switch this screen share here. Let's see. Switching that up as we speak. Perfect. 
Excellent. So here we have the Sandbase Pro, um, the initial screen that we have whenever we do show up. Now, Brian, maybe a good way for us to do this is could you kind of direct me to these uh, different screens here so that we can make the most out of uh, out of this awesome tool right now? 100%. Yeah, let me pull up uh, one of the chart templates that we used last time to help us decide to go long on Chainlink at the time. Perfect, perfect. So I'm going to send you this in our chat really quick, and you can pull it up on your screen. And of course, later we'll we'll do a little screen sharing on my side so I can give a quick market update generally to see how this next week is going too. Uh, but you should see that. And if you pull it up, let me know if it shows you charts. Excellent. Okay, dokey. Pulling it up now. Excuse me for a second. Okay. So I think I'm having some technical difficulties here. Um, let me just try one more thing here. Make sure you're signed in. That could be the issue also if it's on a new browser or anything like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah. I can't I can't quite seem to find the message that you sent me there, Brian. But what I can oh. do is I can pull up the exact uh chart uh the chart loadout that we had the last time we were here i did save that um the main one that you had sent me last time just yeah check it on x too i just sent it there as well in okay. case it's not showing up on Streamyard. perfect perfect here we go this should work too what you're showing if you just toggle link it's the same thing excellent excellent i will do that okay i did get that just for anyone who was really invested on whether we make sure these technical difficulties go away. Um, I'm going to pull this one up here as well. Uh, okay, here we go. On the top one left hand. Go to the, the biggest one, yeah. The yep. biggest one. Perfect. And we're going to link. Chain link on Ethereum. Here we are. Perfect. Perfect. So we're seeing several different charts right now. These are utility indicators, as he just showed at the top with daily active addresses, uh, circulation of link. This one right here, if you full screen it at the top right of that chart, this is the MVRV for Chainlink, basically the average trading returns for any wallet that's been active in the past 30 days or over the past 365 days. And we can see uh, at the time we set this trade, it was about break even. Uh, and since that time, the 30 days actually gone up a tiny bit while the 365 is down a little bit. Ideally, we want to be entering when both are below zero, uh, but we did want to pick kind of a top 20 asset and Chainlink was one of the better looking ones at the time, even though it was kind of neutral. Uh, and to me, MVRV is maybe step one or two anytime I want to look at an entry point for uh, any asset out there. So I think this is a great chart to keep in mind if you're first getting into sentiment tools. 100%. And for our time horizon for this specific trade, which, uh, of course, was a swing trade, so lasting anywhere between a couple of days to two weeks, um, what can you explain to us why we're looking specifically at these two, uh, these these two, like the 30 day and the 365 day MVRV ratio? Mm -hmm. Yeah, normally for swing trading, all you might need would be the 30 day MVRV, because that's a good way of understanding um, within a given month or 30 day period are your competitors, which other traders are, are they down money or up money on that swing trading time scale? And you'll notice uh, if you just uh, exit full screen really quick, Trav, and click on one month instead for the date range right there at the top, right, right where you were. Okay. Uh, All the way right. to the top, right. Top, top, top. top. Yep. Here we go. And just go to last month. Click on that. Last month. There we go. Yeah. And then full screen MVRV again. Perfect. So you'll notice just in the past month, we've had plenty of times where it's below zero or above zero. That's why we like 30 day, because if you're just looking to trade on like a two, three, seven day time cycle, kind of like we're doing with this trade, then you have multiple times in which you can get in while average traders are below that even bar or above that even bar. So from a short-term trading perspective, 
we really like 30 day average returns as a good happy medium where it's short without being way too short term. Um, and then the 365 day, that teal line that comes in as kind of more of a, uh, what, what could I call it? Like a supporter of the 30 day that you're looking at. And if it is below 0%, like it was just barely at the time when we made that trade, then it's telling you that on more of like that hodler time cycle, you're looking at uh, a time in link cycle where you're getting in while those hodlers are slightly underwater as well, which should be a boat of confidence if you're longing any asset. So that's why we like them both, but obviously 30 day is gonna take priority if you're trying to do a short-term trade like we are. 100%, and I do like to see here that uh, let's take a look here. Yeah, like you said, the 365 day, the hodler bracket, if you will, is now in the negative where when we initially did enter this position, it was, I believe, plus 0.5% or something along those lines. So in terms of our trading thesis, uh, at least for the 365 day bracket, I am feeling a little bit more encouraged here. So let's, uh, let's jump into the next metric, shall we? Yeah, scroll down a little bit. Let's see what else. So funding rate here, if you just highlight, like hover your mouse over Binance funding right there. Yeah, so it's it's essentially break even right now. Um, that's fine. I mean, ideally, we just don't want to be entering an asset when the crowd is already longing it, causing the perpetual contract funding rate on Binance to be way above where it, it neutrally would be sitting because funding rates are prone to swing back to neutral at any given time. If there's a bunch of longs, that means longs are more likely to be liquidated and push prices down. If there's a bunch of shorts, that means there's a higher likelihood of those, those shorts being liquidated and prices moving up. You can see a perfect instance right on, I think that's July 5th. Yep, you see how price was at, uh, call it the low price there while you're hovering $11.16. And then the very next day, if you hover on that green candle, the low price was twelve twenty-two, or it got as high as thirteen dollars twenty-six cents. So clearly, if you entered right when that short bar was showing up on Binance, the biggest exchange in the world, uh, you would have done pretty well for yourself because those entry points uh, are often going to just pop right at you in the form of funding rate, just like it would for. MVRV. So I highly recommend this one as a great supporter alongside MVRV. The only issue is there aren't as many big anomalies that show up. You can see for most of the past month here, it's just kind of been flat or close to flat. And those little tiny eight hour periods, which is the time in which Binance updates its funding rates publicly, you got to really act quick and be refreshing three times a day to see what the latest funding rate is in order to catch one of those perfect opportunities. But obviously the last one that showed up worked out pretty nicely. Yeah, and quick plug here, um, just as for anyone who is interested, of course, in using uh, Sandmit or signing up for Sandbase, uh, there are alerts that you can set. And I believe that um, that constitutes the um, the funding rates as well. So if you do set an alert for, let's say, a, a giant uh, bearish spike like we're seeing here, uh, you could get a alert uh, straight to your phone if that's something that uh, that intrigued you. And actually, you know what? I'm kind of inspired to do that myself. Um, and then just for my own personal experience, in terms of confluence, I'm just going to zoom out uh, in, in time frame here a little bit. And then just to kind of make that point that you were saying of these massive spikes in a bear market or in a bull market setting, how they really do consistently indicate the tops or bottoms. Like if we're looking at the bullish funding rates here, any time that we have a spike, one of these massive spikes in bullish funding rates, it demarcates the top of this of most assets that I've looked at, anyways. And it's pretty incredible to see, and and just you know a really nice kind of backup piece of data to have in your pocket to make sure that you're either entering or exiting at a time that's optimal. So, yeah. Let's um any sorry before well, sir, I we drive dive into the next uh into the next metric here anything else on funding rates that you wanted to make sure that uh, our audience was aware of today? No, I mean no need to uh, cover it, but also I'd mentioned Bitmex is an important one to follow. So 
the two main ones that are on sentiment that are updating for every asset that does have funding rate data would be Binance and BitMEX. They're by far the ones that are going to have the most impact on future prices due to any liquidations that occur on either of those exchanges because they have far and away more volume uh, than the other exchanges that also add, have uh, funding rate data. Perfect. But let's move on. Yeah, whale transactions, um, unless there's a big anomaly, I wouldn't put too much time into tracking this for swing trades. All I can tell you is when you see a huge spike, either on the 100K plus bar, which is in red, or the $1 million plus bar, which is in gold, uh, those big spikes are going to be indicative of a direction changer. And usually, whales are going to be most active when they see volatility. So if prices are going way up and you see a big whale spike, that likely means whales are taking profit. Vice versa, if you're seeing a big dip and all of a sudden you see whales uh, getting active, they're not the ones panic selling most of the time. They're usually buying those dips while the crowd's the one going, oh, crypto's dead, better run away. Um, so I highly recommend checking whale transactions specifically when we're seeing big swings in the markets, which we're not right now. Today's actually a pretty flat day. So just want to mention that. Perfect. Again, very happy. Uh, it, that kind of uh, is the same similar concept as just volume that you see on a regular trading chart. When you see those massive spikes um, that kind of precede a move or um, are kind of at the top of a move, there's usually some pretty good signals um, to indicate, you know, either the, the top or the bottom of an asset. And particularly when you're filtering out just and, and you just have the whale transactions, uh, it's incredibly valuable data. And that's actually made or broken a lot of really good trades from, from my experience as well here. Um, mm -hmm. And here is actually the last, uh, both of these here are actually kind of um, talk to the, the last metric that we used to uh, jump into our position here. Can you tell us a little bit about what we're taking a look at here, Brian? Yeah, the first one we don't need to spend any time on other than to explain what it is. This is the number of addresses that hold a specific tier of coins. By tier, I mean the range in terms of size. So one to 10 coins, as you see over on the right, that means it's the total amount of wallets that currently hold one to 10 chain link. Uh, the reason this is relevant is when a, a bunch of small wallets are suddenly rising in number and big wallets are falling. That means the little shrimp wallets, whatever you'd like to call them, they're the ones accumulating while the whales and sharks are dumping to them. Uh, you don't want that if you're bullish. You want the opposite. You want the other small traders, not presuming you're a small trader, but the vast majority of people watching right now are going to be classified as small traders because you're not um, whales. Uh, you don't want to see your fellow small traders and the shrimps out there accumulating and thinking Chainlink is usually is going to go up. Usually they're only doing that if Chainlink's already going up and they're trying to hop on the bandwagon. You want to be getting in while they're running for the hills thinking Chainlink is a bad investment, which does happen. Even with Link being very liked on social media, there are plenty of people who are shorting it or jumping out because price is not going the way they want them to. Uh, and then there's those opportunities. So you want to be following what those large wallets are doing, not the small wallets. And I'll segue that point into the next chart, which is, in my opinion, a bit more of an accurate way of looking at how the whales versus the shrimp are behaving. So we're looking at all the different tiers right now. Um, probably too many lines at the moment, if you don't mind exiting this full screen really quick. And what we're gonna do, uh, click on that button that says merge, and we're just gonna add 100K to 1 million, and one more down, 1 million to 10 million. So this is kind of that shark to small whale tier that tends to be most active. Click, uh, don't click, but hold down control on your keyboard and then click on that top one that you just made, 100K to 10 million. It's black right now, coincidentally. Yeah. So just <laughs> go to full screen. Yeah, and then Here hover over the, yep, exactly. Change to any color you want. 
And you could even make it an area chart. So see where it says line on the top left? Line. There we are. Yes. Yep. Click on area. Looks a little prettier, easier to see. Yes. So there was a big change that happened right at the beginning of July. That was July 7th or so. Roughly two weeks ago from today, we saw a sudden accumulation after prices were dumping. And the 100K to 10 million link wallets were holding 31.62%. If you look at it now, they're up to 324 So just looking at the past three months, you can tell that's a pretty sizable jump in the past two weeks. In fact, it's the largest amount of accumulation it's seen in the past two weeks. And they've jumped all the way back to where they were about a little over two months ago in terms of the overall supply held. So that to me says those key stakeholders, the smart money, if you will, that can actually impact prices, they've been pretty confident in Chainlink uh, pretty suddenly over the past two weeks. Therefore, it should, based on history, increase your level of confidence because generally the smart money, no matter what asset you're talking about, when they start to accumulate, the probability of prices going up increases. It obviously doesn't guarantee anything. There are plenty of anomalies and people who can look at the charts going like, nope, what about that point? They didn't do that. Uh, and prices went down. I get it. It's not a perfect science, but trading in a nutshell, if you talk to every pro trader, they're not fortune tellers that are going to be able to tell you where prices are going to go with certainty. But if they're right 70% of the time, 77% of the time, uh, they make good money, just like a sports better, right? It only takes being right uh, 55 to 60% of the time, depending on how much the online casinos are scraping off the top in order for you to, to make a consistent profit. And that's kind of the approach that many of the sentiment community members take. Uh, and I think this would be one of the best indicators that you'd be you'd be following a 60% plus likelihood event from occurring if you were to see the shark and whales accumulating at this level over the past two weeks. 100%. And again, just speaking from my own experience, I've been using uh, Sandbase and Sentiment now for about seven to eight months. Uh, my most profitable trades have been about 70% thank you to tracking whale wallets and uh, tracking kind of the higher bracket holders uh, to and looking for big spikes like this. So again, this is another metric here that is very, very encouraging to see, especially seeing that we do have that position right now in link. So uh, yeah, no, this is fantastic. Actually, that's that is quite a spike and uh, um, a consistent spike that we're seeing over the last week and a half. It's incredible. Absolutely. Perfect. So that's kind of a recap of how we came to uh, make the decision we did on Chainlink. And uh, as of now, I'm only seeing more signs of confidence that things can turn positive for Chainlink. Uh, it, it obviously is going to depend on Bitcoin's health. You've, I guarantee you, if you're an altcoiner watching this, you've learned that lesson, right? Something could look very bullish for the asset you're interested in, but suddenly Bitcoin's own health uh, takes a nosedive and takes all of the markets with them because Bitcoin is the largest trading pair by far on exchanges. And every time you make a trade for Link, I shouldn't say every time, but a, a large amount of the Link trades out there are connected to Bitcoin. So naturally, Bitcoin is still going to have control over the markets. 16 years into crypto, that has not changed. You need Bitcoin to be able to stay healthy or at least flat uh, in order for other altcoins to be able to thrive. So maybe this would be a good time, Trav, for us to transition to my screen. I can share a few metrics on my end to give people an update on where we're currently standing uh, in the markets and uh, how the rest of July and early August could play out based on the social uh, buzz around crypto, as well as the actual on-chain stuff happening behind the curtains. I'm going to click share screen. Perfect. hundred percent. Let's definitely do that here. I think, um, our goal, of course, uh, at Web3 Matters and Santiment is to provide as much value as possible to our audience. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like by bringing light to these, uh, these on-chain metrics that 
Um, I mean, for the MVRV, for example, is exclusive to sentiment, uh, but the base core data is what sets crypto apart from your traditional markets. It actually gives all of us a the opportunity to actually grow our portfolios in a fair and equitable way, uh, especially comparing to the traditional stock market system. So to be able to actually take this data and frame it in a way like this, like these incredible screens that are just just make this these numbers just brings them to life it is absolutely incredible. And I think it would be is it's a incredible service that we can provide to our audience here today. So especially after we've seen all these massive news announcements over the last couple of weeks, it's been an absolute roller coaster. And um, crypto has certainly felt the effects of that. I think going to take a look at kind of where we're at and, and what might be happening behind the scenes would be fantastic. And then also, Brian, if we do have time, I was con I was curious to know if we could potentially look to see if there are any easy to pick anomalies that we could potentially create a new position um, so that we can reevaluate that for our next call within the next week or two. Yeah, I've got a screen loaded where we can do just that. Um, we can use the activity matrix model that's available to Sandbase Pro members to quickly see which networks are starting to get super hot right now compared to their normal average activity. So um, we'll look at that at the end of the call. I think that's a great idea. Perfect. Uh, for now, I'll just briefly touch on this chart, which we looked at last week. This bright green line is maybe my one of my top two things that I'm checking out on a daily basis. And that is the amount of coins held. This is Bitcoin specifically now, the amount of coins held by 10 plus BTC wallets. Those are essentially mid-sized whales that hold, uh, as of right now, 60 670 to $680,000 or more in Bitcoin. Uh, oh, yeah. And right now they're continuing to climb. So this is really important. They, they currently hold 16.18 million uh, coins. Three months ago, it was at 16.13 million. So to be exact, it was an increase of 45,526 Bitcoin over that time. That's a substantial amount and should give confidence to anyone who's sweating through this volatility and worried that Bitcoin's going to collapse. Um, just know that the the powers that be, the, the people who own the most Bitcoin are betting in favor of it right now. And that's a that's a sign that we should all be happy with, assuming you're on the bullish end. Um, yeah. And we also have like, if you want to get more specific and avoid exchange addresses a little bit more, this is not going to completely do so but 10 to 10,000 BTC wallets are a little more interesting. And most of this is because of <clears throat> the Mt. Gox transfers, which I saw they were, they've been doing some uh, test transfers to Bitstamp today, interestingly. So there should be some major movement in this tier pretty soon. Uh, and the reason I'm using it less is because the, you know, 100 BTC wallets that were part of Mt. Gox a decade ago, they're being consolidated into like wallets that might hold 50,000 BTC right now that are even beyond what is represented by this line. So to simplify, we're just looking at 10 plus BTC wallets for the time being until all the Mt. Gox stuff gets sorted out. Uh, but if you're interested, the 10 to 10,000 BTC wallets, they've been moving up just a little bit over the past month. I just think you got to take it with a grain of salt due to uh, like the trusty uh big moves that are being made like right here on may 27th where they moved like over a billion dollars worth of bitcoin on this day and made this line look kind of funky for a temporary amount of time that was actually may 27th that was actually my birthday so uh it was actually oh, it was big. Wales hooking me up with a birthday present uh, that was for you huh the yeah, billion yeah. or so dollars <laughs> nice Congrats. I promise I'm not going to dump actually to prove <laughs> that and actually to anyone who may have uh, had some alarm bells going off when you mentioned the exchange addresses, um, we, there's another metric uh, that's on your platform that measures the total supply that's on exchanges right now. And I believe I, I last I checked, this was a couple of days ago, but it was at an all time low which when you're looking at um, the amount of Bitcoin that is on an exchange, you want it to be low because typically the main reason why Bitcoin is moved to an exchange is to sell it. 
So <coughs> I think that's, um, oh yeah, you're going to bring that up now. There we are. And I know yeah, it's right. like all the way out, uh, to even the last bull run, it's been just doing nothing but dropping and it's just a, a lovely sight to see. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've been told by the team to take the exact number with a grain of salt because we aren't, there are still addresses out there that we're still adding to our database, mm. but you can feel confident with the direction uh, based on the current exchanges that we do have. So when you see that, you know, we were way up here back in January and suddenly we just have this big drop off and it continues sliding down, this is a very good sign and based on the millions and upon millions of wallets that we do track, this is an all time low in terms of the ratio of coins off of exchanges versus on. So that should be another vote of confidence that we aren't uh, going to see a, a massive sell off around the corner, or at least it minimizes the probability of that happening. Awesome. Perfect. Sorry, I, uh, I interrupted you. I'd love for you to get back on your your train of thought here. Um, we had just covered those whale addresses, and I, I'd love to see what you have next on, on the dock here for us to take a look at. Of course, just like we looked at for Chainlink's MVRV, I think it's important that we check out Bitcoins because this is going to be representative of uh, all of crypto. If Bitcoin's traders are profiting too much, that's going to put at risk every other altcoin out there. And there is a little bit of a concern as of late because we've been on a pretty torrid rise over the past two weeks. Go back to July 5th. This was, I believe, the day before the attempted Trump assassination. Uh, and then almost precisely to the minute after that Trump assassination news came out, we started going on a, a pretty big run. Uh, and we do see that the, let's see, the price of Bitcoin is up roughly somewhere between 19 to 23%, depending on what time of day we're talking about uh, from start to finish. But more importantly, the average trading returns are starting to suggest we're in a bit of a danger zone. The 30 day is at plus 9.4%. If it gets to something like plus 15%, that's a historic zone where we tend to see corrections. Um, and we haven't seen many of those times over the past three months or so, but we have seen plenty of instances in the previous years where you see it go above this line and we just see a, a big drop off right after. That tends to be where traders get super greedy. They're like, oh, this is free money. Look at how much my portfolio is go going up. I might as well buy more now. Uh, and then there's a correction and, and traders tend to kick themselves. So we're approaching that. We're not there yet, but anything above 0% means we are at uh, an increased risk by adding to our portfolios, opening a new uh, position in Bitcoin. And to exacerbate that point, the 365 day, the longer term average trading returns are up at about plus 21% at the moment. Uh, and it's been pretty consistently in the positive range for not just the past three months, but going back like almost a year and a half because Bitcoin's been on such a run, especially after the FTX collapse created a huge bottom that allowed for Bitcoin to kind of make up for lost time. And that was over a year and a half ago now, November 2022. So with both the short and long term MBRVs in positive range, it, it, this is basically suggesting you got to proceed with caution right now. It doesn't guarantee that the, the rally is about to end and we're going to plummet, but the probability of it is increased. So even when it comes to, you know, the, the chain link long, that's thankfully not for real money. It's just a mock trade on San R. Uh, it, it does suggest that there could be some risk if Bitcoin uh, has a little bit of a pullback this week, which there's a higher probability than usual that that could happen, at least on the short term. Gotcha. Hey, I'm going to be sitting here with my fingers crossed that it holds off for at least another week. Let's link. Does it do its move? And uh, then it can do whatever the heck it wants. <laughs> no, Amen. I can't. I yeah, can't. absolutely. <laughs> excellent. Hey, I'm seeing some glimpses of uh, some more funding rates, which is excellent. Seems to be neutral. And uh, where, where are you taking us next up, Brian? 
Yeah, so on the on-chain side, I think we've covered enough. I don't want to get too in the nitty-gritty. You can tune in on, on Friday, everyone, if you want to see our live stream where we'll we'll really go over the uh, intricacies of where the markets stand. But I want to change our direction to the social end of things really quick because there's really two big elements to why crypto prices move the way they are. We went over the whale end and kind of the on-chain factor and even the average trading returns and how that factors in. But there's also the element of greed versus fear, which most of you who've been in crypto, even for a short amount of time, you've heard of, of this phenomenon and how the, the price of crypto tends to go the opposite direction of the crowd's expectation. When you're seeing buy, buy, buy all over your timelines, there's a, a much higher chance that prices move downward. If you're seeing a bunch of people saying crypto is a scam, get out while you can. I'm targeting, you know, $20,000 Bitcoin. The chance of us actually seeing a $20,000 value again greatly decreases if everyone's waiting for that. You know, that perfect storm where prices tend to go up is where people are, say, people are saying, uh, I'm super bullish on crypto, but not right now. I'm waiting for uh, $50,000 because that's inevitable. And when it happens, I'm going to buy a whole bunch of Bitcoin because I'm bullish on crypto, but not yet. I'm, I'm going to wait, right? No one says that about like, I'm sure there are actually some people out there, but you don't see it as commonly in, in like the equities markets where people are like, yeah, Apple is, is definitely going to take over the world one day, but um, I don't think they're going to really increase their value for two years, right? Like if you believe something is, is a valuable entity that people should own because it's going to go up in value over time, you're not going to sit on the sidelines and say, I think it's a great, val a great company to own, but not until 2026. It, the rational rationale behind that just isn't quite there. Uh, and I think some people really miss the boat, especially because crypto tends to veer uh, toward a younger demographic and maybe more inexperienced traders. I'm, I'm not, you know, firing shots at any particular person out there, but the demographic suggests that's the case. And the mindsets and the sentiments of traders tend to go this way where you, you want to delay your gratification just because of emotions sometimes. Uh, so especially two weeks ago or right around the 4th of July, I was seeing a ton of the scenario I just described where it was like uh, people saying, yeah, uh, Bitcoin's down at 58K, but it's not done bleeding yet. I still think Bitcoin's the best investment on earth, but it won't be a good buy time until $45,000. Obviously, those people are kicking themselves now because here we are back at 67 to 68K at the time of this stream. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I'm talking about is people who get overly emotional and try to be too precise with finding those bottoms while still being bullish on something. Um, and when you see the entire crowd or a, a large majority of the crowd talking that way, it usually means we're about to rebound and it's going to be way quicker than what the crowd wanted. So that's kind of what happened over the past couple of weeks. Go ahead, Trav. I don't want to talk too much here. Oh, no, that's okay. I just, um, I wanted to just add to that to mention, and actually, this is a great segue because we just received a, a comment uh, question here that kind of leads to this. And I'll, I'll pull it up on the screen here. Uh, the question's about if we if there's any sort of success rate percentage for these on chain signals, when it comes to the specific social trends and social sentiment, uh, you had sentiment, you've, you've done the, the studies and the, the data analysis, and you found that there's a 72% correlation between, um, I believe is what I read a while back now, so that may have changed. But um, when you see the spikes of euphoric sentiment, um, odds of the price uh, hitting a top is quite high. And then, of course, when you see the extreme bear sentiment, odds of hitting a bottom and ha seeing that price reversal to the upside is also quite high. Um, any insights on this? Or yeah, did I completely really butcher that? I'm trying to remember the 72% what it was referencing. If if I'm not fully confident on, on an exact number, I'm never going to state it uh, on a video or anything. But I will say uh, that we did do an objective back study on uh, trending coins. And mm. 
this is where we found a heavy correlation for any asset that appears in the top three, assuming its price is going up. Uh, in this case, Solana and even Bitcoin would be a good example of this. It's interesting that the top three trending coins are all basically the top cap assets in crypto. That's not usually the case, but it is right now. When you see an asset uh, trending, especially while it's, it's rising, it almost certainly means that there's FOMO related to it. And when there's FOMO, uh, and you see it in the top three, meaning it's it's a coin that's seeing the highest percentage rise in discussion compared to all the other assets in crypto. There's an average of a 12% drop over the next 14 days due to uh, the FOMO effect. Now, I'm going to say that these assets are not the best examples because when you see top caps being discussed, it's very likely due to something more uh, news related, like an ETF launch, right? Like we see for the bullish summary for Ethereum right here. Uh, Solana is a little more related to price according to the uh, AI summary. So that might be a better example of one you may wanna be a little cautious about. And Bitcoin is Bitcoin, right? It's gonna be talked about for uh, very macro reasons like, um, the meta approach to investing it, like the AI summary is describing here. So um, I would say this more applies to, you know, let's say Bonk or Whiff or a meme coin shows up here all of a sudden, or Banana was in there last week for its new listing on some of the uh, largest exchanges in the world. Those would be perfect examples where you'd see an average of a 12% drop as soon as it jumps into the top three, assuming its price is climbing. And that's why people are talking about it. So that's one of the most accurate back tests we've done at Santiment. In terms of like whale correlation, uh, we're not going to give an exact number in terms of percentage, you know, that it goes up or down based on when whales are accumulating and by how much. <clears throat> but it's certainly, there's correlation between Bitcoin's price and, uh, and Bitcoin and, and the accumulation decisions of whales and sharks. And if you don't believe that, I'll show you this quick illustration here. Let's just go back uh, six years and we're gonna take off everything except for this bright green line, get rid of the max and min restrictions. And you can clearly see times in which accumulation was happening and price went up. And then as soon as they started dumping here in early 2022, all the way up until the very beginning days of 2023, that's when price went down. Then they started accumulating again and price gradually goes up. Obviously there's tons of volatility in between that, but you get the idea. There is a definitive correlation between what whales and sharks are doing and the way prices go. Just understand that this is a very long-term perspective, not a short one. Uh, it's fascinating. It, um, I love to see it so perfectly visually represented here on this chart, just like this, that um, it's truly the whales that that move the markets. And when you see on a regular trading chart, these these volume bars in the bottom of each candle, that is multi billions of dollars uh, for each um, time period worth of volume. And us going in and dropping 100, 150, $200 on a token, is going to be insignificant in, in moving the the market in any sort of direction here. So I appreciate you sharing this. I'm, I'm geeking out pretty hard right now. It's it's incredible to see. Yeah, hundred percent. This is one of my favorite charts. Just understand this is not a swing trade type no. of chart. This is a, you know, month by month, check in, see what the whales and sharks are doing. If they're going like this, get a little worried. If they're going like this, it should strengthen your confidence uh, even when you do see some volatility like this stuff going on lately. And you can see right before that F or that that catastrophic dump towards the the lowest of the lows in October 2022, uh, that drop in whale wallets preceded that. So it wasn't like it was a reaction to that drop. They started dumping before or actually I see your cursor up there. It might have been just at the same time here. 
the, the reason, just to cut you off on this, mm -hmm. the reason I would be uh, a little iffy on this point, even though the dumping had been going on well before then, but mm -hmm. this particular drop, this was the FTX collapse. That was the FTX. Right here. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so perfect. yeah, absolutely. It, it still had a correlation with price, but this was such an anomaly. You're not going to see this very often, right? This was basically billions of dollars of wallets suddenly uh, consolidating. In this case, they were consolidating into really tiny wallets. Who knows if this was SBF doing some nefarious things? <laughs> uh, I think part of that was already proven to be true, but who knows how much of it, an effect, you know, Sam and uh, the Alameda's conspiracies that were going on right here had an impact on this line going down. It probably did have quite a, an impact. But uh, yeah, you'll see plenty of examples in smaller scales like this one, where you see a, a big drop in shark and whale wallets in like May and June of 2022. And suddenly, you know, Bitcoin goes from 30K to 19K almost overnight. Oh, I remember that one like it was yesterday. There was a lot of panic happening in the Onyx yeah. and uh, in my circles around that time. <laughs> well, um, going back to exactly going back to crowd sentiment. That this is obviously where we saw peak panic. And if we look at something like, um, let's say, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Brian, but you're sounding a little robotic. I'm not sure if something happened uh, with your microphone. Yeah, this happens from time to time. Let me try something. Hey, you should let me know when you're ready, and I could pull your uh, your screen share back up for you. Perfect. And while we while we're waiting for Brian to troubleshoot here, uh, just to share everyone with everyone kind of a recap and then what our final plans here for our live stream. We've discussed a couple of things today. We've discussed our previous week's trading thesis. We've discussed uh, a bunch of different on-chain metrics and how those led to us developing our trading thesis. Of course, we chose Chainlink because of uh, some whales accumulating. We chose it because of the funding rates were nice and neutral. And the MBRV uh, indicators were showing um, uh, to be a pretty safe region of, of a spot to actually go long on this asset. Right now, we're looking at uh, the correlation of social sentiment and its effect on the market at large, but then also for individual assets as well. And we were just on the verge of checking out um, uh, it was a the social matrix so that we can make a new position that we could then evaluate for our next call. Uh, in a week to two's time. So just going to check in with you here, Brian. How are we? How do I sound? You sound you crystal sound okay? clear. Very, yeah. very happy to see that. Perfect. Sometimes so it just takes a reset. 100%. Um, okay. Let me share really quick. We're close to being done anyways. Uh, let me know when you're sharing my screen again. Gotcha covered. Okay, perfect. So I just wanted to show this in terms of panic and greed right i really like to hone in on the words buy or buying we could even add bought and what this does is it's sharing all of the instances uh, of people mentioning buy buying or bought on five different platforms telegram reddit twitter slash x 4chan and bitcoin talk so anytime people use these three words whether it's sarcastic or not, right? We're, we're bringing up all the times in which they said these words and graphing them out over time. This is every four hours for the last three months. That's what each of these blue bars represents. So now we can say, all right, let's see the negative words like sell or selling or sold. And we'll put them on the same axis. Naturally, there's always gonna be a bit of a bullish bias. So it's rare to actually see there's more red than blue in any given time. But let's go all the way back to the FTX collapse, which was right around here. And you see this bar, that was October 17th. Let's zoom in a little more. We're just gonna say the three months between September and December of 2022. Oh, I think you still have 2023 up there. Yeah, Thank there you. we go. Just no saw problem. that. 2022. 12. There we go. Beautiful. Okay. So we really started to see a low amount of 
people mentioning buy. Uh, while sell was kind of staying flat, uh, this is actually, I mean, I haven't looked at this, this chart in a while. It's not as bad as I thought. Uh, more than anything, we just saw a lot of people getting quiet. Um, people just generally dropped off around this time in terms of opinions about prices. But let's say I change it to the term buy the dip. So this is very valuable to me because you saw a huge amount of people as FTX was collapsing saying, oh, I'm not worried, going to buy the dip. Uh, not a big deal that it just flew past 25K. <laughs> now it's at 20K. Oh, and then goodness. we finally get one final, you know, uh, rendition of people uh, proclaiming it's time to buy the dip right around November 13th. And then it dips a little bit further. And look how silent people are getting here. And especially right here, as the dip just doesn't seem to be bought and does not seem to uh, bounce the way people expect it to. So we get a bunch of empty commentary here toward the end of the year. And we jump maybe like three months further. This should be 23. There we go. And all of a sudden, as people are quiet about it right here, that's when we start to see Bitcoin and all of crypto begin to rebound. So the only point I'm trying to illustrate here is people tend to get initially vocal about buying the dip. And then when they start to get freaked out, when they realize their dip uh, buy did not really come to anything, that's when the actual pop happens in crypto. It goes the opposite direction of the crowd's expectation. So anytime you see a dip, whether it's small, medium, or big, pay attention to how much people are proclaiming that it's time to buy that dip. And if they're really vocal, it means it's not time yet. If people are ignoring the dip, then you might see a really quick rebound. Uh, and that's one of the, the tips that I think a lot of our community uh, has learned and, and try to rely upon in their trading strategies. Oh, it's incredibly valuable to see. And uh, just thinking about that time frame uh, and and living through that, it's uh, the reason that I laugh is because of how real that hits. <laughs> uh, I remember seeing that sentiment portrayed on the timeline on X time and time again. And uh, I mean, it was painful. It was brutal. But there is a huge lesson there to learn that um, often you, the only way, the only reason you can rely on social sentiment is to do the opposite. And this certainly helps prove that here. Yeah, look for those extreme swings, right? Oftentimes it's going to be a lot of noise where people might lean a little bit bullish or a little bit bearish. But if you see when suddenly people are just exploding with buy the dip calls or I'm so bullish, like they were saying back in March of this year when we hit that all time high, those are the times you really want to pay attention and go, okay. People seem to be pretty unanimous right now that the price is going to go this direction. That means I am going to bet on the other direction and you're going to be right a lot of the time that way. I couldn't agree more. Perfect. So, hey, just to take a quick step back here, we've been chatting for just about an hour. We have 628 people watching this live stream right now, which is absolutely incredible. So thank you all so much for taking the time to hang out here with us and uh, just taking a look at what the on-chain metrics are telling us. I hope that you guys have all learned something extremely valuable today. And before we go, Brian, where, what, uh, what sort of position should we drop here today? Do you have anything interesting on the charts that um, is speaking to us at the moment? Yeah, I wish I had a, a definitive answer, but this is actually a really tricky time. I think with the rebound we've had over the past two weeks, uh, the emotional response we saw from obviously the Trump assassination attempt and then the Biden withdrawal just yesterday, we're seeing that U.S. politics are definitely mixing in to the uh, price action right now. It's, it's causing, you know, arguably some irrationality that we have to take into account. So the true value of crypto is going to start to appear after the news stops getting so hectic and we don't have the threat of a, a you know, a chaos or a civil war as some predicted would have happened if, if there was an assassination. Um, but I, I think we'll start to see some normalization. I wouldn't be surprised if things are pretty flat and boring this week. We've been seeing that often over the past couple of years after there's a big upswing so that 
you know, the crowd kind of settles down or they begin to profit take. If they do, if people start to get negative and, and impatient uh, after a period of flatness, then we might see another leg up and Bitcoin could very well hit 70K and beyond and challenge that all time high. Uh, but just watch out for euphoria if your timeline is full of a bunch of people saying that we're about to uh, we're about to see the all time high tomorrow, then then watch out be a little worried. Perfect. So the lesson I'm taking away here is sometimes the best trade to take is no trade at all. And uh, based on what we're seeing, there isn't anything uh, with the level of confidence that we hope to bring to a trade. And I'm not just going to trade for the sake of trading. So our plan will be to let our link uh, positions ride. Uh, of course, the data that we saw for that link position uh, is very encouraging and um, it does seem like there could be um, some further movements uh, incoming based on what we saw with the whales and um, a bunch of the other sentiment uh, indicators that we saw. So stay tuned. And uh, next week, we'll jump in for another call and we'll share with all of you how we did. And the last thing I will say before I cut myself off because I'm monologuing here, uh, I just want to thank everyone who quote tweeted this call. Uh, if we do win, we will choose one of you and we will share our prize earnings with um and I think that's about it. Brian, was there anything else that you wanted to to share or to cover here before we wrap things up? I think we're all set here, man. Thank you all for watching. Really appreciate the time. And uh, we'll be back with another video shortly. Excellent. Brian, it's been an absolute pleasure. And to everyone who's hanging out with us here today, the numbers are just climbing. We're at 643 viewers right now. And I am feeling a huge amount of gratitude. So thank you guys all so much. Trade safe out there. Set your stop losses. And uh, we'll chat with you guys soon. Have a wonderful day. Recording over? Uh, just taking it sweet.